Well, good morning. I've done my morning walk to this wonderful tree. So far they haven't kicked me out of here. We're looking at Neanderthal. Creationism versus evolution. Neanderthal man, which does it most support? So far, it's a fully developed, superior man to today's man even. Live longer, greater mental capacity, certainly greater physical capacity. So we have a, a site in Shanidar, Iraq. So we're at BibleStudyManuals.net, K95.htm. Search for Shanidar, Shanidar, Iraq, where they found some Neanderthal material and used radiocarbon. Some of the Shanidar, Iraq, Neanderthal material, sometimes the Neanderthal, it just depends upon who spells it, from layer C and D in that site, archaeological site, give radiocarbon dates as low as 26,500 years ago. And the Neanderthal Bolognus mandible found near Girona, Spain, that gave a radiocarbon date of 17,600 years ago. After recording this date, which was obtained by the UCLA Radiocarbon Laboratory, the Radiocarbon Journal made the following comment. For a Neanderthal, present date is too recent. Well, let's throw it out. The possibility of more modern travertine contaminating older travertine to yield a more recent composite date. See, they're looking for an early date to support their point of view instead of just observing and reporting. That's science. Or the relocation of an ancient mandible in a travertine is open. So they don't like the date. So they say, well, maybe somebody just moved it or something some event moved it. The date's too recent. Wow. That's not science. That's some kind of a religion. Berger and Libby, Radiocarbon Journal. Possibilities are given for the too recent date. Speaking about the same thing. But no physical evidence is cited to indicate that these possibilities are valid. The arbitrary assertion, assertion that the date is too recent for a Neanderthal apparently settles the matter. Well, we just put that on the shelf till we find something else that supports our point of view better. If there is any, if there is any legitimacy to these recent dates for Neanderthal, it could mean that Neanderthal, like his smaller edition known as Homo erectus, persisted until quite recently. That would be additional evidence that the differences between Neanderthal and anatomically modern humans had nothing to do with the evolutionary process. For evolutionists, the Neanderthal problem remains unsolved. Keep putting things on the shelves, you're going to have to build more buildings and more shelves. Whether the Neanderthals were in the main line of human descent, or whether they were a side branch that led to extinction, the evolutionist believes that the somewhat different Neanderthal morphology was the result of the evolutionary process. The two evolutionary mechanisms are mutation and natural selection. Mutations supply the raw material, new information, upon which natural selection can work. That's what they say. Special creation and evolution are thus mutually exclusive. If God, by special creation, supplied the genetic information which accounts for the existence of humans, then evolution is not necessary. This would just be variation within the species. If random mutations are able to supply new information upon which natural selection works to produce humans out of a non-human stock, then the concept of special creation is not necessary. That's where the divide is. Evidence shows the former, not the latter. The evolutionist improperly introduces other mechanisms into the alleged evolutionary process such as the founder principle, geographical isolation, and genetic recombination. While these are legitimate processes, they are not evolutionary processes. They do not create unique, new gen genetic information. Nor do these processes discriminate between special creation and evolution. They would apply in either case. The evolutionist smuggles these non-evolutionary mechanisms into the evolutionary process 
even though they have nothing to do with the evolution. These processes do account for variation within the species, but they cannot produce evolutionary changes that result in increased complexity. That would demand the creation of entirely new genetic information. So in the genes, some Neanderthals exist today in the terms of the morphology that they say is more uh, Neanderthal-like. They're out there, we're not wearing shoes. Uh, they're out there under certain hardships or certain primitive living situations, either cold or hot. They're alive Neanderthals, modern humans. It is impossible for the evolutionists to determine that the Neanderthal morphology was the result of mutation and natural selection. That is only a dogmatic assertion that is part of a belief, his belief system. Over the years, the scientific literature has suggested a number of conditions, geographical, environmental, pathological, cultural, and dietary, that could produce a Neanderthal-like morphology. Especially pathological, a number of evidences of primitive man, so-called, turns out one specimen had rickets, another was a child. So you have a lot smaller the Neanderthals were a lot smaller. It was a child. You know, this one was bent over because he had rickets. Richard Klein writes, The forward placement of Neanderthal jaws and the large size of the incisors probably reflect habitual use of the anterior dentition as a tool. So your normal human, you start using your teeth as a tool, especially during the Ice Age. So they didn't have the tools as much, perhaps mostly as a clamp or a vice. Such para or non masquitatory use for gripping is implied by the high frequency of enamel chipping and microfractures on Neanderthal incisors. By non dietary microscopic striations on incisor crowns, and by the peculiar rounded wear seen on the incisors of elderly individuals. Get to be old, your morphology changes. Similar, though less extensive damage occurs on the teeth of Eskimos who also tend to use their interior jaws extensively as clamps. You know Eskimos exist today? Wonder. Biochem biomechanically, the forces exerted by persistent, habitual, non masquitatory use of the front teeth could account in whole or in part for such well-known Neanderthal features as the long face, the well-developed superorbital torus, and even the low, long shape of the cranium. Massive interior dental loading could, could further explain the unique Neanderthal occipitomastoid region, which perhaps provided the insertions for muscles that stabilized the mandible, that's the jaw, and head during dental clamping. So Richard Klein, Human Career, Human Biological and Cultural Origins. In two paragraphs, Klein has given plausible non-evolutionary explanation is my spoon. Touch my face with my spoon, I won't touch it with Germans on my fingers. Non-plausible, non-evolutionary explanation for most of the unique features of Neanderthal morphology. Just as the hands of a blacksmith develop calluses as a result of the unique, unique wear and, and stress as they are subjected to, so the facial and skull morphology of the Neanderthals could be the result of the unique stresses their jaws and teeth were subjected to when used as tools. Something so simple is ignored. Klein also states the long, low shape of the Neanderthal cranium with its typically large occipital bun in the back. Probably reflects relatively slow postnatal brain relative to cranial vault growth. In a statement cited earlier in this chapter, Geist also gave plausible, a plausible non-evolutionary explanation for the unique Neanderthal skull morphology based on his prowess as a hunter. If great strength, agility, and precision and speed of bodily movements were required for such a hunting technique, <clears throat> these parts of the brain controlling motor functions in the hunter had to be greatly developed. Survival. Neanderthal possessed a massive cerebral, cerebellum and motor cortex compared to modern humans. This pulled the brain case rearward, creating an occipitate that reached further rearward, rearward 
then in modern humans, explaining in part the large, long, low brain case and bun-shaped occiput, occiput, I guess, of the Neanderthals. So there's reason within the species to resolve these differences, but stay human, modern humans. Klein also recognized the effect geographic isolation could have had on the development of the Neanderthals when he wrote that some of the European mid-quaternary fossils clearly anticipate the Neanderthal, while like-aged African and Asians ones do not. Clearly the implication is that the Neanderthals were an indigenous European development. Oops, moving around a little too fast. Health factors can be reflected in the skeleton, especially a vitamin D deficiency resulting in rickets. Remember, I said rickets. J. Lawrence Angel, Smithsonian Institute writes, pelvis and skull base tend to flatten if protein or vitamin D in diet is inadequate. J. Lawrence Angel, History and Development of Paleopathology. This was the diagnosis of Rudolf Virchow, the father of pathology, when he examined the rather flattened skull of the first Neanderthal discovery. He was overruled by those who favored an evolutionary interpretation. In 1970, Francis Ivanov, however, published in Nature an article entitled, Was Virchow Right About Neanderthal? He presented a strong case based on diagnostic evidence that the Neanderthals were really modern humans who suffered from rickets. Lubinow, in his book, Bones of Contention, when the first fossil human was discovered, the original Neanderthal was several competent medical authorities stated that the peculiar apish shape of the bones was caused by rickets. In 1872, Virchow published a carefully argued and factual diagnosis that the original Neanderthal individual had been a normal human who suffered from rickets in childhood and arthritis in adulthood. Virchow's diagnosis has never been refuted. It may perhaps have ignored largely. He was personally familiar with the original Neanderthal fossils and expertly acquainted with the disease of rickets. Virchow was well acquainted with rickets because rickets was particularly common in the industrial parts of Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. The same industrial pollution that darkened the barks of the trees in England, which in turn caused the ratios in the peppered moth population to change from light to dark, which was falsely claimed by evolutionists as an illustration of evolution in action. But it didn't change from one more species to the next. It was the same moth. Harrison Matthews, in another word, uh, Introduction to the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, also obscured the sunlight in those industrial areas. The result was that many children, especially those who have inferior diets, suffered from rickets, the same way that the peppered moths changed their colors. The relationship between a sunless climate and a high incidence of rickets was well known by medical authorities in Virchow's time. However, a vitamin D deficiency as the cause of rickets was not identified until after World War I. Because rickets is clinically most active in humans between the ages of 6 and 24 months, vitamin E is now added to milk in most Western countries. The result is that rickets is virtually unknown today in the United States. However, a friend of mine born in a poor section of Boston in 1913 recalls rickets as being a rather common disease during his childhood years. <clears throat> a more recent identification of fossil humans and rickets was made by Francis Ivanhoe in a paper in Nature. Ivanhoe said that every Neanderthal child skull studied so far shows signs compatible with severe rickets. In that same article by Ivanhoe, these include the child remains from Engis, Belgium, La Ferrasi, France, Gibraltar, Pex de Lays in France, Aquina in France, Saracels in USSR, and Subaliuk in Hungary.
Less extreme cases are seen in the child.